So at this point, I've probably measured hundreds of home studios, and I can tell you if there's one type of bass trap that works without a doubt every single time, it's the porous material bass trap. Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And this is week two in my bass trap breakdown series, where I explain every single type of bass trap out there, cut through the nonsense, and hopefully allow you to make smart and educated decisions about your acoustic treatment. This series is accompanied by my complete guide to bass traps and bass trapping, which you can download completely for free at the link in the description. Everything that I'm covering from foam wedges to tuned resonators is neatly organized in there for you to reference at any time, which of course includes how to identify a certain type of bass trap and potential causes of confusion, what they do, how and when to use them, how many you need, and the pros and cons of each. Now, last week we talked about the myth of foam wedges base traps, as you'll find them on Amazon and just about anywhere on the internet. But this week we're talking about the real workhorse of home studio acoustics, porous material base traps. Now these are pretty easy to identify. This is usually just a square or a rectangular shaped box filled with open cell foam or insulation material, some type of porous material. And to make sure that it looks good, it's usually just covered at the front and at the back by some sort of fabric. The most confusing thing about these types of bass traps is that they're not really pure bass traps at all. Like many of the bass traps that we'll be covering in this series, these are broadband absorbers. So in reality, they basically absorb the entire spectrum. And the question simply is how low down in frequency they also go. And that is purely dependent on the depth. There is no kind of officially agreed upon depth as of which you would call it a bass trap. But in my experience, anything above about six inches or 16 centimeters is something that you could call a bass trap if you use it accordingly in your studio. There is a lot of debate about the density that is optimal for these types of absorbers, these types of bass traps. But the way it really works is that you define how low down they absorb by choosing the right depth. And then you simply optimize the insulation material density, or in particular the gas flow resistance, to basically absorb optimally at that depth. So in a nutshell, shallower depths can get away with using slightly denser materials, but basically the deeper you make your trap, the lower in density you want to go because you want the sound to be able to transmit through the entire depth of that material. One other potential cause of confusion that I often also see is a sealed back. So it's the box with the insulation material, fabric on the front, but then the back is sealed with wood. And that really doesn't make any sense at all because then you can't leverage the air gap or the power of an air gap, which allows you to increase the effective depth of your absorber without actually using any more material. Now, in terms of how they work, it's basically the same as with any type of porous absorber. So it works by friction of air molecules in the sound wave, by rubbing against the, the fibers in that open cell foam or in that insulation material. And through that friction, they create heat in the material, which basically robs the sound wave of its energy. So the important thing here is that these are sound velocity absorbers, not sound pressure absorbers, which basically means that you also, in theory at least, have to place them in a location of maximum sound velocity for the sound wave that you're trying to absorb. Now, since sound velocity and sound pressure are exactly 90 degrees out of phase, you want to actually place this porous absorber material at a quarter of the wavelength of the wave that you're trying to absorb. And that's where this whole quarter wavelength rule comes from that you might have heard about in terms of absorbing sound waves with porous absorption. So what does that mean in practice in terms of what they can absorb. Well, let's jump back into our porous absorber calculator. So I'm just gonna model 
a 16 centimeter or a six inch absorber real quick to show you what that gives us, right? And so if you place this on a wall directly, it's not really a base trap yet. But if you leverage the power of an air gap, for example, by placing them across a corner, you basically get an added extra depth of with your standard kind of two by four or 100 times 60 centimeter panel of maybe 30 centimeters. And now we're starting to get that absorption effect in the low frequencies that we're looking for. The point is that we always have to remember that in order to absorb these very long wavelengths, 100 hertz already has a wavelength of about 10 feet or three and a half meters. You need the depth in order to actually put something in the path of these long wavelengths that they'll actually see and interact with. You need that depth in order for this to have effect. There's no way to cheat physics when it comes to this. So then how do you actually use these properly in your studio? Well, the point is that these aren't targeted absorbers. There's no point in trying to target individual frequencies with these. This doesn't really work in my opinion. So once you have the depth, it's a matter of putting as much of this in the room as you can possibly justify. And again, depth is everything, right? Especially if you place these across a corner, you'll naturally create an air gap that increases the low frequency performance. And if you put enough of these in your room, you'll actually get the effect that you're looking for in terms of damping low frequencies, damping standing waves. So then when should you choose porous absorber base traps over other types of base traps? Well, the simple answer is pretty much always, right? So because they work broadband and they absorb mids and highs along low frequencies, these are kind of tools that allow you to do everything in one package. And that's what gives them this great bang for the buck. So these should be your first choice if you're just starting out with treatment or if you're working on a budget, AKA a home studio. And when I say on a budget, I'm saying anything with a budget below five figures. And in general, with any type of acoustic problem, because most acoustic issues reach down in frequency low enough that you really need a tool that works in these low frequencies, even though it might just seem like you're absorbing reflections. There's a reason why high-end studios use so much of porous material in their acoustic designs. And just as an example, here's Northwood Acoustics, who, if you haven't heard about, about them, what rock have you been living under? If you go on their on-the-job page, there's a whole bunch of really great pictures of studios in the construction process. And so one of them is, for example, this one here. And you can see just how much porous absorption is used in the studio. It's basically everywhere. It's literally everywhere. Here's another one, right? And just for fun, a picture of all the insulation material used. This is a high-end design. There are different types of insulation material used in this design. It is definitely not the only component used for absorption in the studio. As far as I understand, these are also multi-layered absorbers. So that means that the actual low-end, real low-end absorption in this case happens with resonance absorbers behind the insulation material. But again, these are custom designed super high-end studios. We or us in the home studio world, we have to leverage the use of porous absorption much more than these designs do. And so really the only option we have is to get the most out of porous material for low end control as, as well as mids and high frequency absorption. But yeah, basically in all types of acoustic treatment, 80 to 90% of the material used is porous material, insulation material. And there's a reason for that. That's why we also use it in the home studio. So how many do you actually need to see an effect? Well, I already mentioned this is a quantity game. So the more the merrier really. But in my experience, you can see effects happening when you basically introduce base traps from a kind of two by four or 100 times 60 centimeter size in a three to four units package, right? So basically 
you start off with, let's say, four traps, you'll see some effect. In the next step, you might introduce another four, and then another four, and then another four. It's easy to put basically up to 40, maybe 50 of these types of base traps into your room. If you're wondering how many I have in here, this I think is about 40 base traps of this design in order to get control of my room. But yeah, at a minimum, I would recommend you start with four and then always calculate in steps of about four panels in order to actually see a significant benefit from them. And if you wanna see just how well this actually works, there are plenty of examples on the Acoustics Insider YouTube channel. I'll link it up in the card right now. So these are rooms, customers of mine that I've worked with, that have helped to get their low end under control. And all these videos show you with exact measurements just how far you can get with only porous absorption. Now, a few issues or mistakes that you want to avoid with porous base traps. The first one is not making them deep enough. There used to be a very broadly spread myth a few years back that four inches of material are enough to function as a base trap. In my experience, this just isn't enough. It's just below the threshold that I would consider a base trap. Even if you place these across a corner, you're just not getting that effect yet. You have to up it to about six inches, 16 centimeters in order to actually get the effect that you're looking for. And of course, anything beyond that will only increase the amount of low end absorption. But there is also an area of diminishing returns, at least when it comes to kind of price performance versus the, the benefit that you're getting. And so around the 16 centimeter or six inches mark really is the kind of Goldilocks zone in terms of base trap design for home studios, in my opinion. The other mistake that to avoid, I already mentioned it, is a backing plate, a rigid piece of wood on the back of the absorber that doesn't allow you to use the air gap to your benefit, which is really what you need in order for these to work in the low end. And then finally, just obsessing too much about the density. If you mess around a bit with the porous absorber calculator, you can see the effect that changing the density of the material will have on the curve that you're basically getting from this insulation material at a certain thickness. And the point is that, first of all, the differences aren't as great as you'd think. And also, the specifications on the density aren't nearly as accurate with the products that you're actually buying. So it's not like you actually have that detailed control over the density that you're getting. Thankfully, like I said, it's not that important as long as you're in the ballpark. Yeah. So this entire obsession about densities, especially when you're just building your own traps, if you're just getting started, isn't really worth it because you're getting the effect from the depth of the material, not from the density of the material. So that brings me to the pros and cons. First of all, obviously, they're very cheap. They're easy to do design, build, and use in your studio, unlike resonance absorbers, for example. That wide bandwidth, the fact that they're broad spectrum, gives you a lot of flexibility. You don't need to target particular frequencies, which, especially in a smaller room, can be quite difficult in practice, because maybe you just can't put the trap where the ideal pressure zone is. Of course, these materials are widely used in construction, so they are basically available all across the globe, which makes it, again, really easy to get access to this type of absorption. And then finally, predictable results. If you do it right, you will get the results. It's as simple as that. Of course, there are a couple of cons as well. Obviously, they are broadband. It's a mixed bag. You're absorbing mids and highs as well. Sometimes you might not want to absorb that much mids and highs, but that just comes with the package. You do need that depth, which in turn means you need to sacrifice that space. And in very small rooms, oftentimes you're not able to do that, at least not to the extent to get full proper control. You can improve any room, but there are limitations in terms of the use of space and also obviously how much space you're willing to sacrifice. I mean, if you're willing to work in a small box like this with everything else being insulation material, you'll, you'll get great sound, but who wants to work that way, right? And then there's obviously the 
quantity that you need as well. Again, this plays into the use of space compromise that you just have to make. Now they do come in a few variations worth knowing. One of them is with a range limiter, in particular by GIK, and they used to also sell Owens Corning with this FRK surface, which was some type of, I think, basically heat insulation that was that was glued onto the insulation material, and supposedly that increases base absorption. In my experience, my experimentation didn't show that to actually work. They do limit, obviously, high frequencies from entering this absorber from the front. Low frequencies will still bend around the surface and then get absorbed. So that is an option if your room already feels too dead. The other option is what I call a diffuser front. And what you see in my studio here and in many of the studios of my clients, it's basically the design that I show you how to build in my Build a Better Base Trap course. But they also come on commercial products. So again, here's the GIK Amplitude series and also the Scatter Face by Music City Acoustics. And these basically work as very simple type of diffusers that you can stick on top of your bass traps, which then help you scatter frequencies usually somewhere in the range between 2 and 7 kilohertz. It makes the room feel more lively, more relaxed, not as dry, which in some instances might be a nice thing to have. Now, when it comes to making this decision between DIYing or building your own panels and just buying off-the-shelf commercial products, the only real difference is the price that you pay. You can pretty much equal the performance of commercial products with your own designs. The only difference obviously being that you're not paying for the labor to build these things. And that's really where the largest chunk of the cost of porous absorber base traps sits. Because in terms of materials, they're pretty cheap. And in terms of design, they're not particularly difficult either. So the cost of the actual construction becomes a much larger chunk of the total cost. And that's where the largest save comes from when you build them yourself. Obviously, if you're building up to 40 panels like this, you can imagine just how much money you're saving by building them yourself. Of course, that also means you need to have the time and the space to build these. But in my experience, you can basically build these on your kitchen table or your living room table. You don't really need any specific crazy tools to do this. And the time investment is also manageable, especially if you batch build these. Maybe you get a friend in to help you out and you can really knock out a lot of these panels in a weekend, for example. So in summary, what do you need to watch out for when you're looking at using porous absorber base trap? Mainly the depth. Second, the quantity. You need enough of these. You need to be willing to sacrifice the space. Make sure you leverage the power of an air gap behind these panels to actually get that base absorption. And obviously that also means to make sure they're not sealed at the back. And of course, if you want help with this, I want you to check out my Build a Better Base Trap premium course that you can find on my website. I'll also link it in the description. This is everything you need all in one place in order to design and build your own base trap with a diffuser front in order to keep your room lively. So I cover all the steps in there, the choice of material, how to package it up, how to find the right wood, and then obviously step-by-step -step video instructions for putting it all together and making sure it actually looks professional. So if you're ready to finally get control of the low end in your studio, following a method that works, that has shown to work, check out my Build a Better Base Trap course at the link in the description. All right, next week we're covering tube traps, the cylindrical mystery. Is there something special about it? Hint, no, there isn't. But it's still interesting to have a look at these and understand exactly what they do. But with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.